What do you think of when you see an old Jeep CJ3 or M38? Looks like it belongs in a museum. Looks like it's some fun off-road, but no way would you want to drive it on the highway. I'd like to share with you today some of my passion for this long-lost cousin, a wonderful little Jeep from Japan. In 1955, Willys gave Mitsubishi Heavy Industries a license to produce CJ3B Jeeps in Japan. This was during the time of the Marshall Plan and its push to rebuild post-war Japan's industrial base. Around the same time, Mahindra in India was given a similar license, but I'm less sure about their motives there. But Willys were very generous with licensing rights in those days. The first models were known as the J4 and the J3, and were assembled at the Mitsubishi Pajero plant. At that time, Pajero was the name of a plant and nothing else. The SUV that you're thinking about didn't come along until much later. The CJ3 models arrived in kit form and were assembled on the new production line at Pajero. You can see the same hood lines and general design of the CJ3B and M38 here. They quickly started to ship these first to a Japanese forestry service and then the National Safety Force, which soon morphed into the Japan Self-Defense Force that we know now. By about 1955, they were already producing their own licensed version of the Hurricane engine, but more on that later. Many J3 models were exported to the ARVN, for example, almost indistinguishable from their M606 counterparts. In 1959, Mitsubishi launched its first civilian models, such as the short 80-inch wheelbase J10, which looks like an exact replica of the CJ3B, and a long wheelbase 104-inch J11 hardtop delivery wagon, both for domestic sale. Both still used many parts imported from the US, but they were quickly moving parts production to Japan, and some early models uh, just have the Willys mark stamped on the grill. Later ones, the Mitsubishi Star and the Willys name show up alongside each other. Once the J3 got the new KE47 engine, production ran pretty much unchanged until 1973. The J10 and J11 models, they started out with the Hurricane engine, and shifted to the KE47 once the supplies of the old engines were used up. Both of these civilian chassis variants were available with the KE31 diesel engine beginning in 1958, but more on that later. Right-hand drive models were actually only added in 1961. By the end of the 1950s, Mitsubishi had decided the platform needed a facelift and some expansion to keep the civilian market interested. They also started to eye the export market. I don't know if they had toyed with the idea of adopting a newer platform, maybe Willys wasn't being as generous as they had been, and whatever the reason, they set about updating the design and making something a little distinct from the military J3. In addition to the short 80-inch wheelbase and the stretched 104-inch version, the new J20 model's wheelbase fit in the middle at 88 inches. The new fenders got an additional front valance, which sets it apart visually from its flat fender ancestors. They've also added more vents on the side of the tub that lets more air into the footwells. At the back, the spare tire and jerry can locations are reversed from the M606. Although the kickoff J20 model kept its JH4 Hurricane unit, a diesel engine based off of that soon appeared called the KE31. The diesel model was known as the J20D. At this time, civilian models became available in both right-hand and left-hand drive, with the left-hand drive models being known as the J21 and J21D. The side lights became squarer and less military-looking than those of the M38 and J3. The windshield still folds down, but the tubular hinges were replaced with sleeker cast metal items, and it's at this time that the Willys name sadly disappears from just about all view and only the Jeep name remains stamped on the side of the hood. The mirrors moved out to the fenders and the service light next to it is more rectangular and civilian looking. 
Mitsubishi are going out of their way now to not just make the Jeep better, but make it their own vehicle. It's no longer just a CJ3B replica. Less obviously, improvements were made to drainage and construction to help to stave off the inevitable rust that those tubs were prone to, but it wasn't perfected and rust was still a problem in certain areas, as we all know and love them. Most of the nuts in the suspension and steering, even the subframes, are castellated or lock-wired or have lock pins. Uh, overall build quality is said to have become much better than Willys ever managed, but then the budget from the JSDF might have been more generous than what Uncle Sam had to offer post-World War II. And let's remember that these vehicles were all expected to last a very long time. There were many subtle changes made to improve the reliability and comfort of these platforms, uh, like tweaks to the exhaust routing to reduce body contact, and steady improvement to the engines to make them quieter, to seal them better, make them live longer, etc. A lot of these changes were driven by the market to the civilian population. Alongside the J20 came the similarly refreshed J30 with the 104-inch wheelbase in a soft top, hard top, and even a delivery van variant. So starting in 1960, there was basically one new model launched every year with everything from soft top, short wheelbase models to mid-length wheelbase models in short and hard top, and long wheelbase models in hard top, soft top, and even a delivery van. All of them available uh, with either a gasoline or a diesel engine, and only the delivery van didn't make it being axed after just four years. This shift to the J20 design was not the end of change, but rather marked the beginning of an era of slow evolution that the truck went through that progressed over the course of the decade. The diesel engines had appeared in 1961 with the new KE31 unit, and it, it wasn't a great engine by any means, but nonetheless the diesels quickly began to make up the bulk of the production. The J20 and J30 series would get small incremental improvements throughout the rest of the decade. We roll into 1970 with nine Jeep variants in production, which was probably about as many models as the Pajero plant could manage at that time. The J-Series came into the decade with an 88-inch wheelbase J24 model launching in 1970 with the new 4DR5 diesel engine. It was joined that year by a new J50 series, the first model sharing 4DR5 engine installed in the J3's chassis. It kept the shorter 80-inch wheelbase and the tub was not much changed, keeping the old-school long window hinges and fold-down rear tailgate. It was, however, facelifted by adding the Valance front fenders and extra vents from the J20 series, along with the rectangular lamp clusters and mirrors on the fenders. It also adopted the same spare tire and jerry can layout from the J20s. The J3 model itself was phased out and retired in 1973. KE47 and KE31 engine production ended not long after that. The J24 was then quickly adopted as the standard military model for the rest of the decade. The short wheelbase civilian J20 series was also rehashed in 1974 with the 88-inch wheelbase J22, but this only lasted a year, being replaced in 1975 by the J26, now with the 4G53 Astron engine. J50 series gasoline models were introduced in 73, but using up the last of the KE47 engines. Once those were finished up, they switched to the new 4G53, and that model became the popular J56. A 2.0-litre 4G52 version joined in 1978, known as the J58, but most popular was the original 4DR5 diesel version, the J54, which lasted through the decade, along with the J24. The 104-inch wheelbase range was seeing declining sales and was cut to just one five-door SUV and one soft-top truck with the J30 morphing into the J38 and gaining the new 4G53 engine and the J44 with a 4DR5 diesel. 
the Japan Self-Defense Force adopted the 88-inch wheelbase J24 as the Type 73 light truck or half-ton truck with the addition of military lighting equipment, extra brackets for radio antennas, mounts for shovels and axes, etc. More seats were added to the base A and A2 models so that they could carry five passengers versus two in the old J3. More military variants were added and the payload that the vehicle was expected to carry and tow kept increasing. As the years went by, more and more parts became common with other Mitsubishi and Fuso trucks, helping to cut costs, though the military models kept many of their unique parts. The 88-inch wheelbase had now become the standard military platform. Despite all the culling and the fact that Pajero production had begun at the plant in 1979, Mitsubishi still ended the decade with nine Jeep variants in production. If the 1960s had been marked by a huge proliferation of models and ideas, and the 1970s a little more focused on slowly improving those creations, then the 1980s, in hindsight, see a real focusing of the line into fewer models. While there had been an explosion of new model numbers pertaining to different chassis types, different combinations of hard and soft tops, it's mostly the updates to the engines that drive the model number changes after 1979. The final long wheelbase models, now the J47 and J37, were axed in 1982 and 1984 respectively, ending both the J30 and 40 series. I'm sure that by now there were lots of competing real trucks on the market with four-wheel drive, not just an extended Jeep. The civilian J24 appears to have disappeared not long after the military adopted it, so the civilian models available now comprised of just the J50 series, and going forward J2X designations were only used on military models that were in turn based on the J20 series civilian models of the 1960s. The J58 morphed into the J59 in 1981, but kept its tough little 4G52 engine. The J57 was launched in 1981 with a beefier 2.6-litre 4G54 engine, and the J54's long and successful run ended mid-decade with an upgrade to the new direct-injection turbocharged 4DR6 and was renamed the J53. This now got new steel wheels and tubeless radial tires, no doubt improving the road manners no end. The military J24 followed suit, adopting the 4DR6 engine to cope with increasing payload requirements and became the J23. There were some other changes to the windshield wipers and an underhood snorkel arrangement was adopted as time went by, and I believe that the military J24 and 23 were available standard with only the diesel engines. Gasoline was to special order only, and then even perhaps only for export. And so it was that for most of the decade, only 80-inch and 88-inch wheelbase models were built, mostly diesels and all of them soft tops. The 90s is unfortunately the final chapter of this story. Going into 1990, there were two gasoline-powered short wheelbase civilian models, but they were retired in 1993. The civilian diesel J53 model and the 88-inch military J23 were all that remained in production alongside the Pajero. It's both ironic and somehow fitting that the original J3 design, a simple short wheelbase soft top model, had survived with its basic dimensions and description pretty much intact. By now it looked a tiny bit different and had a more modern power plant. The J23 with its roots in a 1959 facelift had grown into 10 different variants for differing military duties. The two gasoline drinkers were retired in 1993. 
the J23 and J53 were upgraded one last time in 1995 with the 4DR5 intercooled turbo diesel engine and were themselves axed in 1998. We've talked a bit about the different engines used in the Jeep's lifetime, but now I want to go over those in a bit more detail. The very first models, J1 through J4, used the Willys manufactured Hurricane or F-head engine of 2.2 liters. By 1955, a Japanese replica was in production and designated the JH4 for Japan Hurricane four-cylinder. Remember that this was under license, it wasn't a copy. Perhaps they could have called it the Typhoon. The Hurricane put out 75 brake horsepower for most of its life cycle and was always a bit thirsty. In 1958, the K31 diesel came along. Although it's not usually a great idea to base diesel engines off of gasoline units, that's exactly what they did. Based on the Hurricane engine with higher compression and a new overhead valve cylinder head, this little 2.2 litre only produced 61 brake horsepower to start, albeit at a very low fuel consumption. They persisted with it and slowly got power up to about 67 brake horsepower. In 1967, a test was arranged by the US Army Tank Automotive Command to try out a JC3, that's the J3 Jeep with the K31 diesel engine, and assess that against the M38. The test was very thorough, carried out at a tank proving ground, and is really too long to go into in great detail here, but maybe I'll cover that in another video. They managed to break one of the engines that had some build quality issues, and got the other one to not start by using rather heavy oil in very cold conditions. Otherwise, they summarized that the vehicle had identical off-road performance to the M38, showed much better fuel economy, up to 20 miles per gallon in cruise, and only suffered from slightly poorer acceleration on the road. In addition, there were more comments about the noise and vibration of the engine on longer road journeys, which Mitsubishi took very much to heart. In the mid-1960s, the Hurricane was superseded by a Mitsubishi-designed gasoline engine of 2.3 liters with an overhead valve layout, coated the KE47. Though it was more modern with overhead valves, it was not a cross-flow design. The KE47 put out about 95 brake horsepower and this returned a top speed of about 95 km per hour and cruise economy of around 17 litres per 100 kilometres. This was available largely unchanged right until the end of the J3 production, which was in 1973. 18 years is quite a long run for a production engine, and this unit powered a very large number of vehicles for Mitsubishi. The KE31 didn't fare quite as well and was phased out by 1969. In 1970, the diesel models had an entirely new 2.7-litre 4DR5 unit that produced 80 brake horsepower and 18 kilogram meters of torque, and that was first installed in the newly updated military version of the J20, known as the J24. The new engine had a balance shaft and was much smoother and quieter than the K31. Given that the KE31 was developed off of the Hurricane, which was in turn de derived from the Go Devil, that really shouldn't be a big surprise. By 1974, the KE47 had given way to the new overhead cam Astron series engine. First up was the 2.3 litre 4G53 unit, then the smaller 2 litre 4G52 unit came into the lineup. For those who were worried about fuel economy, and soon after a beefier 2.6 litre 4G54 unit came for those who weren't. Astron series engines are still in production today, so we won't go too much into those. I had a Delica or L300 van myself back in the day that had more than 100,000 kilometres under its belt and with proper maintenance ran like a top. In 1985, the naturally aspirated 4DR5 was considered a bit short of pulling power for the extra loads that the military J24 was being asked to manage, 
and it was replaced with a new turbocharged direct injection 4DR6 going into both the military J23 and the civilian J53 and that put out a healthy 94 brake horsepower and 21 kilogram meters of torque. By now top speed was up to about 110 kilometers per hour if you were brave and the economy was around 8 liters per 100 kilometers in cruise. The series finally ended up with a turbocharged intercooled 4DR5 in the last models J25 and J55 with 100 brake horsepower and 22 kilogram meters of torque. That's right, the model progression that followed through the years is just about as confusing as ever with first a J24, then a J23, and then a J25, and the concurrent civilian models being named J54, 53, and 55. Except for the early J1 through J4 models, which were 3-speed, all of the Jeeps got a BorgWarner T90 4-speed synchromesh gearbox and a Dana T18 transfer. There are separate levers for 2- and 4-wheel drive modes, plus for low, neutral and high ranges. Neutral is used in case a power takeoff is fitted. There is a mechanical lockout to prevent low range being selected while in 2-wheel drive. Throughout all the later model years, the Jeeps retained the same Dana Spice of 44 rear axle and Dana 30 front axle. Note that most CJ3Bs had a Dana 25 front axle, and I think the older J3s also had those. So this is an upgrade from the CJ3B, even though the Dana 30 is greatly maligned by 4x4 enthusiasts. Both the front and rear diffs are open, and the front Dana 30 is the weaker type with CV joints for steering. I believe that the civilian models could be ordered with ISIN locking hubs, but the military versions did not usually have them fitted. On the diesels, the final drive ratio is 4.77, and the low range transfer gear is 2.306. So, in first low, the overall gear reduction is about 36.4 to 1. Now you add your J23's 21 kilogram meters of torque at 2000 RPM, and this adds up to well over 1,700 kilograms of driving force at the wheels. That will push the fully laden 1,960 kilo Jeep up a grade of well over 100%. All models have solid axles with leaf springs front and rear, controlled by monotube dampers. This is still largely borrowed from the CJ3B. Aside from stretching the wheelbase, some changes were made over the years to gasoline models to reduce suspension travel and improve the angles on the pinions, UJs and slip joints in the driveline. In a departure from the CJ3B, all models feature hydraulic drum brakes with dual hydraulic circuits and a vacuum servo. Vacuum is provided by a vacuum pump on the back of the alternator, at least on the turbo diesel models. Front brakes are twin leading shoe and 280mm in diameter, while the rears are single leading shoe at 260mm. The service brake is the same cable operated drum brake found on the CJ3B. Riveted construction military type steel wheels are used in 15 by 5.5k sizes with flaps and tubes and fitted with 7 by 15 six ply non directional tires on all the models right up until 1970. Older J20 civilian models got by with the same, just painted white or black. But later J54 and up civilian models got more street-friendly cross-ply tires that look something similar to what the Land Rovers of the day were wearing. J53 models got to wear a sleek steel wheel with triangular holes, much like those popular still in the aftermarket now, in 15 by I think 6J with highway terrain type 215R15 LT radial tires, again in a 6-ply rating. As far as I know, no 16-inch wheel or combat rim was ever fitted stock on these Jeeps. Bolt pattern on all models is the old standard 5 lugs on 5.5-inch PCD, so any GPW, MB or CJ rim would bolt right up if you wanted to use those. 
24 volt electrics are standard on all of the diesel models with two 12 volt starting batteries wired in series. Civilian diesel models have a preheat position on the combination ignition starter switch and have an electric solenoid to cut fuel flow when the switch is moved to the off position. The military models get no such luxuries and the engine is shut off by a symbol cable. There are no engine electronics beyond the glow plug timer relays. Alternator outputs peak at 20 amp on the 24 volt models and there is a vacuum pump on the back of the alternator to power the servo brakes. The military models feature M38 style four position lighting switches to switch between the service and blackout modes. There's a blackout driving light fitted to the front fender on the driver's side. Also standard on J24 and later models are a small fog light on the front fender and a reversing lamp. J24 and later models have two standard NATO sockets for trailers and other accessories, one on the back and one on a fender. Those are fitted on the right on J24 models and on J25 models but on the left on the J23. That's due to the intake snorkels being different on the turbo but not intercooled J23. The gasoline models appear to have 12 volt electrics, but I'm not sure if that's just the civilian versions. Some models came with heaters and blower units, but none came with air conditioning. Instrument panels are very simple with a speedometer, ammeter, gauges for fuel, temperature and oil pressure. There's a simple panel light to illuminate this and the gauges have markings and needles that glow in the dark. You get a warning light to let you know when the glow plugs are doing their thing and civilian models also got a warning light for the handbrake and even a cigarette lighter and ashtray. Fancy! After 1970, base models for personnel and light cargo transport were designated to J24A, J23A and J25A. A2 versions carried a Type 3 wireless communication system. P versions carried a recoilless rifle. K versions a Type 87 anti-tank guided missile launcher. GE and GN versions carried a Type 79 guided missile launcher for either anti-tank or anti-landing craft use. Some military models were fitted with a Koenig power takeoff or PTO. Some military models were fitted with a Koenig power takeoff or PTO. The usual application for this was to power a 400 amp generator that was fitted to the front bumper where a winch would normally sit. This was fitted to J24W models and that could power an arc welding set for field repairs. The 1980s J23 brought new SR versions which carried a radar system and had jacks to stabilize the vehicle. The SH version carried an orientation system while the SC version carried a communication relay system. SR, SH and SC versions were all equipped with electric winches and were usually painted in camouflage colors. Obviously the models fitted with these systems had reduced personnel carriage counts. All J23 and civilian J53 models got initial rail seat belts, which were presumably to meet Japanese road safety standards, and those carried on into the final J25 and J55. Small numbers of vehicles were produced for JSDF military police units with small megaphones, roof-mounted single beacon lights, sirens, grill flashing lights, and special white paint. We tend to think that military vehicles are exempt from regulations on road safety features, emissions and noise. This was not the case in Japan. You might have a machine gun or even an anti-tank missile launcher on your jeep, but it cannot be noisy or smelly. So since even military vehicles have to meet Japanese emission standards, it was becoming clear in 1990 that we couldn't go on like this forever. 
The final J25 and J55 used a unique turbocharged and intercooled 4DR5 unit. This was because it was found that emissions could be improved very slightly by using the earlier indirect injection engine with its higher compression than the 4DR6. As a side effect, it was also very powerful. Even then, the writing was on the wall and in order to meet upcoming standards, electronics would just have to take control of diesel fuel injection parameters. Production of all of the J25 and J55 models ended in 1998. A new light truck was introduced. Although it was called a Type 73 light truck, it was merely a militarized version of the second generation Pajero light to midweight SUV, complete with air conditioning and an automatic transmission. The new Type 73 Shin was built upon the same production line as the civilian Pajero that it was based on, and the Japanese CJ3B was built no more. In all, about 200,000 units were built during an astonishing 43 years in production. The Pajero plant itself closed down in 2019. The Japan Self-Defense Forces themselves carried on using the Type 73Q, or old, as it was now known, right up until 2014 when most of them were demobilized, auctioned off, and sold as surplus. Sadly, that was also the signal for Mitsubishi to suspend production of the unique parts for the Jeep. Thanks very much for joining us on this journey, and I hope that you'll come along soon for a, a tour around my own 1988 J23 GN. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe for more of my video rambling. Bye for now.